They are rage, brutal, without mercy, but you you will be worse. Rip and tear. Until it is done. The only order that matters. I have dug my grave in this place and I will either triumph or I will die Reclusia Grimaldus, hero of Hell's Reach. He triumphed. By the way, where is your god oh yeah. He's with me now rare Black Templar war cry motto. They are absolute lunatics Rogel Dawn the Black Templars are a second founding space marine chapter of the Imperial Fists. These space marines are as manly as the manly marines and as angry as the angry marines. They make a hobby of dressing up as the Knights Hospitaller and trolling the Inquisition with their larger than codex approved numbers. They're righteously angry for the Emperor. They typically favor close combat and focus their charge in a blitzkrieg assault of a hundred angry crusaders who won't hesitate to skullfuck the nearest alien mutant heretic with their power sword just because they look funny and or smell of heresy. Although they don't need swords that much, the Black Templars and their iconography are of a mixture of the Knights Templar, Teutonic Knights and the Knights Hospitaller. Basically if you need someone shit pushed in hard by a power armored fist, these are the guys you call. Quite possibly one of the fewest, if not the only. A starts that the Chaos Heretics and Chaos Marines genuinely fear, like literally shat and pissed myself fear. This fear is extended to Imperial allies, who the Templars have no problem weeding out those they see as weak in strength or faith with a not so polite bolt round to the head. So yeah. Even the Imperium is afraid of these absolute lunatics. Kaina explains why everyone in Hell's Reach was only moments away from shitting their pants every time they spoke to one of the Astartes. As of 9th edition they are said to be heading towards the Octarius clusterfuck as well. Passing by and save the Forge world. About the Black Templars. The Black Templars have their origins date back to the first company of the Great Crusade era Imperial Fists. A group originally known as the Templar Brethren. They wore all black armor and had black crosses on their right pauldron and shields. They were sworn to protect the temple of those. Okay. The reality is that Forge World wanted to justify including Black Templars into Horus Heresy. They're really more Templar than Imperial Fist at this point already. Their commander and first captain of the Imperial Fists. Sigismund started the tradition of the Emperor's Champion, in which a Templar would challenge the enemy's champions to single combat. The Black Templar mentality was born during the Siege of Terror, when Rogel Dawn allowed Sigismund to unleash himself in utter silence. After the heresy had ended and Rob out Gilliman called for the second founding, Sigismund took his Templar brethren to found the Black Templars during which Dawn gift the new chapter a tier VIE Ocean War Cruiser, Cross of Dawn. They express their fury through burning heretical texts, as kindling for the actual heretics, winning mutants, and skull fucking aliens. But you might say, isn't that what every other Spiss Marine chapter does? Well, you'd be right, but they are the most proactive about it. Celebrations on finishing one crusade involve declaring a new crusade. Recruits are taken from all the planets they've been on, then sent to join the fighting so that they never have to slow down, and they usually fight by Zerg rushing their enemies with hundreds, and sometimes thousands of heavily power armored superhumans holding power weapons while screaming a litany of curses at the top of their superhuman lungs. Also unlike other chapters, they don't have scout teams, as they think they're not righteously angry enough. Instead all new neophytes, weed, meat shields, are given some crap and schooled in the field by a fully appointed marine called an initiate. The foundation of Black Templar tactics are based on Sigismund's anger management issues teachings rather than Robo Gorilman's stupid book. This involves a bias for close quarters combat, since the best way to make sure your enemy is well and truly dead is to skull fuck him with a chain sword, and a focus on dueling and honor bound vengeance for the fallen. To quote the 4e codex. In battle, the Black Templars continue to fight in the style of their founder, Sigismund, preferring close combat to ranged warfare. Face to face with the enemy, a Black Templar can earn glory and respect and be sure that his foe is truly vanquished, fighting with righteous fury and the noblest ideals of honor. This is further emphasized by the fanaticism of Black Templar's battle brothers whose righteous anger makes them loath to retreat before an enemy. They will drive towards the foe relentlessly, their own casualties only serving to spur them on faster, 
hungry for vengeance on the slayers of their brethren. The Codex also notes that the Black Templars use two specific tactics most often, fairly similar in the broad strokes to how other space marines fight. The first tactic is the classical death from above where a devastating orbital bombardment is followed by a rain of drop pods and thunderhawks, aimed to destroy vital targets. The other tactic is referred to as the armored spearhead, used if the Black Templars can land heavy equipment. Then they'll use bikes and land speeders to range and launch probing assaults, finding them smashing through the weakest spot in the enemy defenses with land raiders, rhinos, predators and vindicators. These columns will then slash left and right, eliminating and quite likely encircling individual enemy strong points until nothing is left. The Black Templars are the largest loyalist. Codex following. Chapter. Estimated to have at least over 2000 marines in their ranks. This is primarily because the Black Templars sometimes split their crusade fleets to achieve different campaign goals and they're scattered throughout the galaxy so the correct number of Templars in active service is only known by Helbrecht, himself High Marshal of the Black Templars. Unfortunately, they are unwilling to fight beside Seekers except for Grey Knights. They got all buddy-buddy with them fairly quickly. Enough so that they willingly shared the STCS for the Land Raider Crusader with them. Mind wipes notwithstanding of course. They also have a fondness for holy worlds, making with all haste to prioritize their defense before anything else. They are descended from the Imperial Fists, but obviously got more of Dawn's angry splodge than his patient splodge. They sometimes get to wear cool Crusader helms which are at least 10 times as awesome as the Beaky's Corvus Helms. The new Space Marines Codex has changed several things about the chapter. It now states they worship the Emperor as a god like the larger Imperium and they have close ties with the Ekelshiarchy. This also makes them good friends with the Sisters of Battle, whom they regularly team up with and have several alliances with. Emperor pity the heretics who have to face both of these groups of zealous nutters at once. Alternatively, you can choose to ignore the fluff in the new codex that says that they worship the emperor, as it is wrong and demonstrates a clear ward-like level of disregard for previous, and better, fluff as it also says that out of all the starts chapters, only the Black Templars worship the Emperor. This contradicts several novels that say the chapters they revolve around worship him. The first that come to mind are James Swallow's series on the Blood Angels. Then there's the fact that Grimaldus, the Black Templar's high chaplain, you know, guy who knows better than anyone else what they believe, said that they do not worship him in ADB's sequel to Hell's Reach. Blood and fire. Shame the newer fluff decanalizes the old, but advancement is advancement. Games Workshop says everything is canon so the debate is pointless. Besides, GW itself consistently holds that space marines do not worship the Emperor. GW lore even goes into details explaining that the Imperium accepts it as a quirk due to them being so physically and spiritually close to him that he only seems less divine to the space marines. The Inquisition and Ekelshiarchy don't like it, though. So, we have GW say everything is canon in a multiple layers of reality due to warp fuckery sort of way. And we have GW also saying that space marines do not worship the Emperor. Since they own Warhammer 40,000 we can safely say that space marines not worshipping the Emperor is the norm but there might be exceptions. A prominent example being the Blood Ravens from Dawn of War. Regardless, they are utterly fanatical in enforcing the Emperor's will. Not what the Akalshiarchy or Imperial Senate claims is his will, but his actual will. They refuse to work with, and often butcher, sickers because the Emperor said sickers and sorcery were no nos. Logically, this means they would also respect his decree not to worship him and that he is not a god. The Black Templars were a second founding chapter, so they would be fully aware of that. As a curious aside, the chapter's fuck the man policy has lead them to collect some odd friends. They are the only known allies for a few chapters including the Celestial Lions, Libators, 
and staff anthems. This is also reflected by their largely independent attitude regarding anything. During the Great Apostasy, the Templars led the attack on the Imperial Palace to arrest Goj Vandar. In regards to the introduction of the new Primaris Marines Helbrecht was surprisingly open to them, ultimately seeing their value and even creating new crusades for the Primaris Greyshields. However some marshals in the chapter saw them as borderline heresy and loathed them to no end. One chaplain and a band of like-minded marines and the Angevin crusade took this hatred to its logical conclusion by killing the entire torchbearer fleet albeit at great cost and nearly breaking the crusader host as a whole. This includes all the Primaris marines, the custodes escort, any marine who voted against such an action, and Marshal Angevin himself they justified this by saying the Primaris were calls creations and thus impure meaning anyone who supported them was a heretic, even the Custodes and Gilliman. Let it be known that with enough blind zealotry, the Templars can damn near kill anything, probably due to how the warp works on reality, since one Custodes should be able to kill a company to a chapter of Marines on his own. Ultimately an investigation was ordered by Gilliman himself lead by an Imperial Fists Primaris who ultimately defeated the offending Castellan in combat and led the remains of the Crusader host against the word bear of which only a single neophyte survived, who in fact saved Gilliman's representative from the last of offending crusades chaplains after he tried to kill him for discovering what his comrades had done. For the sake of unity he kept the secret to himself as all the guilty were dead anyway but does show that while constantly valorized in most depictions of the Black Templars, their blind zealotry can be a real problem when it's not being pointed at the right target and something Gilliman will have to keep an eye on in the future. Or it would be if this was zealotry instead of heresy and treason. Call was part of the Astartes Primarch project. He was part of creating them all in the first place which means he already has the Emperor's approval. Plus, the Primaris are made using pure gene seed and part of the Custode's own creation process. To be against either of these things is blatant heresy. The only part in any way questionable is the Belisarian Furnace. The incident with the Angevin Crusade was not of blind zealotry with the wrong target. It was flat out heresy as it went against Imperial beliefs including that of the Black Templars. It proved that anyone can be corrupt either through lust for power, taking control of the crusade for himself, or self-righteous delusion, ignoring the tenets of their own belief and replacing them with what they want to believe. Not to mention that killing a custodes is probably the most heretical thing they could have done for obvious reasons. On a side note apparently the Black Templars have a particularly high success rate in crossing the Rubicon Primaris. No one knows if it's due to divine intervention from the Emperor or maybe they are just as stubborn to die. Due to how the warp works, this could literally be true. Heck, the Death Spectres chapter literally die and will themselves back to life as part of becoming a space marine. So it is absolutely possible for the Black Templars, from this page, especially their accomplishments. You might think they're better than everyone at what everyone else tries to do. You'd be right. But nobody has a problem with that because they're absolute badasses full of righteous anger for the Emperor. They are one of the only chapters who fights like a mass-produced version of the Thunder Warriors would be expected to do. Malay. Basic tactics and letting their armor and rapid support vehicles handle the rest. Instead of Raoul playing as power armored guardsmen like almost every other chapter is obsessed with doing accomplishments, vowing to go on an eternal crusade as part of their deal during the second founding and keeping it going non-stop for 10,000 years without getting killed or so diminished they had to settle down to rebuild, which is a really impressive feat even for superhuman starts. Although the Horus Heresy novels have revealed that Sigismund didn't start this voluntarily, he was exiled by Rogel Dawn, and a lot of their more notable traits, like their absolute hatred of Sickers, stems from Sigismund's butthurt over how he got exiled in the first place. Not forgetting about the Chaos Space Marines who fled into the Eye of Terror. When Abaddon and company first busted back out of the Eye of Terror, Sigismund was up in their business within the hour. 
and he nearly killed a baron and lost for bullshit reasons. Even so, the Chaos Marines had such deep respect for him that they returned his body in war gear totally unharmed, taking back a hundred planets that were stolen by the Blue Space Socialists after the Ultramarines realized the Tyranids were heading their way and prioritized stopping the all-devouring bugs over the Blue Eyes, killing an alien seeker and accidentally blowing out 10 billion astropaths in the process. Oops just as planned. To be fair, said Sika was too powerful to let live and the Black Templars didn't know its power would explode. Which implies this was not normal for Sikas. Wiping out countless alien species and actually sparing one alien species that was worshipping the voice of the Emperor when they got there. They only destroyed their temples just in case this voice wasn't talking about who they thought it was. We can assume they spread some sort of teaching of Emperor worship and possibly super the creation of new temples to the emperor just to be sure. Or they were total dicks about it. Successfully capturing Cypher then they were forced at gunpoint to hand him off to the Dark Angels chapter where he almost immediately escapes. The second siege of terror when some crazy ass high lord of terror named Goj Vandar usurped all power in Imperium. Thinking that he can do everything he wants. He wiped out some Templar fortresses with orbital strikes and when they found out they got all righteous angry assisting Sebastian Thor. The Templars gather around a thousand crusaders and along with some other chapters as well as the Martian Techno Guard, the Black Templars, with all fury. Wage of fracking second siege of terror saved Forge World of Sigma Ulstri in the Octarius War. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedgear.co.uk. One stop shop for Kumjar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and DND 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Keeps, as the Black Templars are too busy being useful. They feel no need to have a permanent chapter monastery. Instead, they will throw a keep on every few worlds they pass by. They are Imperial Fist successors after all. In fairness, their flagship the Eternal Crusader is a Gloriana class battleship. You know, the same class the Emperor himself used as his flagship. So they don't really need a base beyond that. Some fans have speculated that because of this, combined that they have been doing this for 10,000 years. The Templars could have fuck huge numbers of marines. This is a retarded joke started by TTS that makes no sense. Not every keep is staffed with marines at all times. The 9th edition supplement makes this fact abundantly clear, as did the 4e codex back in its day, which contradicts their lore and that of the Imperial Fists, which is that the keeps are their source of recruits. So. We're to believe they willingly limit their own number of recruits or that they abandon worlds that allow them to build those keeps despite it being a very important part of their function and culture inherited from Dawn. Although, it wouldn't be entirely unreasonable for them to staff keeps nearby the Crusades path. Considering travel times in 40k, you don't want to wait for recruits coming from the other side of the galaxy. They have been known to abandon these keeps only to return and reclaim them later, usually exterminating anything foolish or unlucky enough to have taken up residence in their absence. When keeps are staffed they are commanded by a castellan, who is responsible for the upkeep and defense of said keep. He is also responsible for the recruitment of aspirants into the chapter, who go through some of the most intense training of perhaps any chapter, by which we mean they are forced to fight each other, walk through traps in the dark, and throw their arm into a blazing fire while reciting fucking scripture, all while being indoctrinated into complete and unquestioning loyalty to the will of the Emperor. Yeah, the Templars are absolute lunatics, but how does one become an aspirant it generally depends on the location of the keep. On death worlds, 
an aspirant might fill the back of some dangerous beast with swords and bring an offering. On other worlds, prospective warriors might be press ganked or even kidnapped into service. Just to remind you that ADB's interpretation of the Black Templars can be full of shit. To add further insult to injury, the Templars keep serve no purpose defensively, or even to improve the lives of the people on the planet. They serve only the Black Templars' interests. Why no one has called out the Templars for leaving empty fortifications all across the galaxy that any genius could steal for themselves can only be called a miracle. Must be high faith in the security system. Organization since the Imperial Fists told Papa Smurf to go fuck himself and his Codex, the Black Templars have an organization different from Codex chapters. They organize themselves into fighting companies, with much of it on the fly. Their ranks and positions include, High Marshal, the chapter master of the Black Templars, who decides which crusades the Black Templars will participate in without bothering for an okay from the High Lords of Terror. Helbrecht serves as the current High Marshal. Interestingly enough, in their original codex the High Marshal and regular marshals typically do not go face to face with the enemy, to the point where Helbrecht never actually touched down in the third war for Armageddon. He stayed in space dictating the orbital battle. Marshals and High Marshals prefer to stay back assessing the battlefield and advising the various squads through their communicators about where they should strike and shoot to make the most out of their troops. The irony of such a rage happy rip and tear chapter having a reasonable and intelligent command style is not lost. Marshal, the commander of a crusade, a marshal is equivalent to a captain. They are the ones that lead the individual crusades. When a crusade is called and there is no marshal to lead it a candidate is chosen from among the sword brethren and if the high marshal thinks he is fit for the task appointed marshal. There has only ever been one case of a candidate being rejected by the high marshal. It is from the ranks of the marshals that the new high marshal is pictured he fall in battle. Emperor's champion before an undertaking usually during battle preparations. One of the Black Templars may have a vision granted by the Emperor. This knight will be declared by the chaplains to be the Emperor's champion. As their founder Sigismund was 10 millennia ago, he will be given the Black Sword and the Armor of Faith and serve as an inspiration to the rest of the crusading host. As with the first Emperor's champion, Sigismund, it is the sole duty of those who bear the title to seek out and challenge any enemy champion the crusading force meets in battle. If he is killed before his mission is completed is considered an ill omen indeed, though there is no requirement for every crusade to actually have one. The 8th edition codex says there is only ever one in the chapter at any given time. It is unknown what happens to the knight who is chosen after the completion of a crusade as none have been shown to survive long enough for it to matter. Other chapters, most usually Imperial Fist successors, occasionally have an Emperor's Champion who serves a similar purpose but without the artifacts. Castellan, the Lieutenant of the Marshal, a temporary position chosen by the Marshals. One guy cannot be everywhere, and who is a Castellan can vary depending on the current crusade or even the current battle. Pick who's best to lead the current fight. The Castellans lead the fighting companies of a crusade, and they are also chosen from the Sword Brethren. Sergeant, the only codex rank the Black Templars employ. Also from the Sword Brethren. Notice a pattern. Yet, Sword Brethren, roughly analogous to veterans in codex chapters. Sword Brethren are the senior battle brothers of the Marshal. They also get to use Terminator armor. Initiates, rank and fire battle brothers, Marines, typically neophytes. Dying around them has a beneficial effect on initiates, making them run harder into enemy gunfire for reasons unknown and oft speculated upon. Neophytes, while most chapters have their neophytes serve in some sort of reckon force, the Black Templars have their new Space Marines join the Crusade at the front lines and hit the ground running. Given that this has worked for 10,000 years, they may be onto something. Every neophyte is assigned to an initiate who is to train and tutor them. The neophyte serves as the apprentice to the initiate. Sort of like Jedi in Star Wars but the neophyte gets smacked if they even dare bitch about sand. They are also quite useful to initiates to use as shields. Literally, in battle. Chapter Strength. Despite being a codex chapter, 
Well, they're a codex chapter as of the newest codex, they basically just cherry pick whatever they want from it. In particular, they're exploiting a loophole in the codex starts that says a crusading chapter can go above the limit of 1000 marines, doing what most overstrength chapters do which is not flaunting their numbers. The Adeptus Terra lacks the ability to enforce the number limit on every chapter and instead just makes examples out of those who go too far, because the Templars are doing so much and avoid concentrating their numbers. The Adeptus Terra is willing to look the other way because honestly they can't afford to fight the Templars and honestly kind of need them. But Ordo starts Inquisitor yet mob think otherwise and has spent 100 years trying to prove their rule breaking and punish accordingly, even though they usually have multiple crusades going on at once. They must be the best marines around. Seeing as every other crusading chapter has roughly a thousand marines, usually less, guess that's what happens when you genuinely embrace righteous fury and unleash it upon the alien, the mutant, and the heretic. However, it's not actually clear how many marines they actually have. Some neckbirds, both fanboys and bitter opponents, exaggerate the actual numbers referring to them as legion strength and or believing that their numbers are figuratively without limit and end up with ridiculously high guesses. Given the vagaries of an universe time due to warp phenomena and the inevitable depletion of assets due to the nature of their work, as well as the fact that they have shit record keeping due to a complete lack of librarians, the actual number of active Templars would be in constant flux. In Blood and Fire, Grimaldus mentions that they typically have dozens of crusades going on at any point in time. Other sources tell us that the Black Templars as an entire chapter actually consist of a total of three primary crusade fleets from which all other fighting companies are split from and deployed on their own secondary crusades when necessary. This coincides with the original codex, which said that there were usually no more than three crusades at any given time but that they can stretch themselves according to necessity and states that in one exceptional case there were up to 14 crusades operating in the segmentum solar during the treachery of Darmok. If we were to base the numbers of the estimate in the back of the 4th edition codex, Black Templars, the deployment map totals greater than 6000 marines, with several of those crusades routinely exceeding 500 marines. But when you factor in normal redeployment over the years that number isn't very helpful as many of those crusades were finished by the time others arose. When you consider it like that, many other chapters have deployed in mass over the years and would also generate a similar deployment map. Furthermore, only a handful of crusades numbered relatively close to 1000 with only Armageddon passing it. With 1,232 marines total and even that number was questioned by the author. For this campaign, High Marshal Helbrecht was said to have mustered three crusades. So we can either take it as written in the order of battle that the three crusades represent the normal three crusades and hence the entire chapter, giving us an absolute minimum of over 1,000 marines. Or we can assume that the three crusades are not the primary crusades at all, which still doesn't give us much of an indication of the chapter size, leaving us at square one. To make things even more confusing, each crusade will be accompanied by a black sword and a set of the armor of faith, to be used by the emperor's champion. The 4e codex said that every crusade and fighting company would have its own champion, but the 6e codex and the newer novels changed this older fluff and said that there could only be a single champion in the entire chapter at any given time, and that only a handful arise every century. Plus, there are only 10 black swords in the chapter and they are held by the chaplains, just in case they find the champion within their crusade. This implies that there can only be 10 crusades active at any one time. Hence, if the three crusades at Armageddon, taken to be around 1232, are three tenths of the chapter's overall size, the Black Templars have around 4,000 Marines. However, the novel Eternal Crusader flat out says that the whole chapter could gather together on the Eternal Crusader itself and barely tax the capabilities of the vessel, and that the mere 200 Marines of Helbrecht's Crusade, which constituted one-fifth of the Black Templars' total forces, 
meant that the vessel was mostly empty, making them far more chapter sized. The book also shows I Marshal Halbrecht purposefully exaggerating the size of his contingent at Armageddon from 400 marines to 900 in order to gain overall command of the Astartes forces that had arrived. Many chapters had brought a lot more men than the Templars and would have had more right to overall command. Helbrecht would later leave Armageddon briefly to muster more Black Templars, but only bringing the number up to what he promised. So it is easy to see how the size of his contingent would be misleading to an outside observer. The old codex also suggested somewhere between 5000-6000, if certain accounts are to be believed which places a level of uncertainty on the number. And if you consider the above statement would sound reasonable if you took Helbrecht at his word about the availability to Black Templar soldiers and could easily show how the administratum has been misled into thinking the Templars are much larger than they actually are. ADB also suggested about 6000 in an offhand comment, therefore, it is currently our highest reasonable upper limit without resorting to guesses. Also, chapters in general have a habit of seconding marines to honor companies which are basically autonomous companies or ones dedicated to certain tasks or seconded to other forces. The codex allows for an infinite number of honor companies as they aren't within the chapter's chain of command and are essentially their own miniature chapter, though probably cannot get their own recruits. Chapters commonly use this to totally circumvent the recruitment restrictions, which of course means the number of Astartes actually in the galaxy is impossible to know even if every chapter had exactly a thousand marines and there were exactly a thousand chapters there could actually be a quadrillion fucktons of marines for all we know. The author of Eternal Crusader later acknowledged on his blog that the Black Templars could have maintained extreme numbers in the past but that the overall strength of the chapter was reduced to a thousand, more or less, as a result of a corporate decision by GW, not just of the Codex authors. Heresy it is perhaps best to repeat the Black Library's own take on the fluff. 40k is in the fucking dark ages and everything written down could be a legend. Propaganda, an event that happened or a rumor based on a real event. Any guess as to the number of marines and the Black Templars is just that, a guess, and a book offers only the author's point of view, or what he wants you to think, or he himself is a fabrications. 8th edition still maintains the information confusion over the Black Templars actual numbers. Just like before, while the Imperial Index states that each Black Templars battle fleet contains thousands of warriors, the actual Space Marine Codex states that the size of each can vary from several battle brothers to several hundred and though it also says there is no fixed number of crusades. The latest fluff from Cyclic Awakening, Faith and Fury gives a throwaway line that each of the crusades is comprised of thousands of Space Marines without substantiating how many crusades there actually are. There are, are still only 9 black swords in existence. Gilliman destroyed one to defeat Scarbrand during the events of Rise of the Primarch. So one could infer that there are anywhere between 2 and 9 crusades at most, and their arrangement can change fluidly, just as mentioned above. Of course, since thousands of Astartes per crusade would still mean that at minimum there are 4000 Black Templars in the chapter as that is the only way for the bare minimum of crusades plural and thousands for each. Not much seems to have changed. Fanboys and opponents can believe what they want. Apparently, the book Throne of Light states that the Black Templars number somewhere around 25,000 Astartes spread across a myriad of crusades which all have their own cultural quirks about them. This is a stupidly high number of marines, and it can be presumed the only reason the Inquisition hasn't done anything about this is because the Templars are faithful, zealous, and really good at turning heretics into a grimy brown paste. That and the few inquisitors stupid enough to question the Black Templars openly have a nasty habit of walking face first into bolt pistols. Or that they're so spread out that they are functionally totally separate chapters anyway and so worrying about it is basically pointless. Oh. Also they have apparently stolen gene seed from other Imperial Fist successors in the past which is kind of fucked. Odd Sickers. What have the Sickers ever done for us navigation? What? The navigators are Sickers. Oh. Yeah. That's true. And the Astropaths. Yes. Them as well. Warp travel and communications. I'll grant the Sickers are pretty good at that. 
and the Grey Knights. Well of course the Grey Knights. We'd be in a right mess without them now wouldn't we? But apart from the Navigators, Astropaths, and Grey Knights, what have the Sickers ever done for us brother Regulus addressing his squad for most of their history the Black Templars didn't have any librarians. This was generally thought as a pretty simple fact. They hate all forms of witches. They even have a special rule called Abhor the Witch. That was until 6th edition when it was more explicitly stated that they had no real compunction against astropaths and navigators. Since they were the only people who knew how to drive the massive crusading fleets, pure unadulterated holy rage can't steer a ship through the warp after all. Of course, this was always true since the BT always accepted those sickers that the Emperor himself had sanctioned. Although they watched them closely, which includes astropaths, navigators and, surprise, surprise, the Grey Knights, which invalidates the logic of the following paragraph. According to the GW apologists, the major difference between their codex and 6e is their opinion on other sickers, in previous works. It was made pretty clear that they wouldn't suffer the witch no matter who they were, except for the aforementioned groups the Emperor sanctioned personally, and as such literally couldn't ally with any other sicker using force except for the Grey Knights, and even then, it was AOC. Note, AOC is a 6 ed construct. Come the 6 e codex however, suddenly all their hatred for every sicker was scaled back to merely just being a hatred to all enemy sickers. Some may call this fluff rape and all that in their neck but at rage. But others realize that setting up tons of restrictions would ultimately serve to cripple the Templars and ultimately just kept things easier by just generalizing it. To say nothing of the fact that the Emperor himself was a sicker. Not to mention the whole organization of sanctioned sickers used by the Imperium. Those guys were permitted to operate by uh, someone. Right if it was the Imperial Senate, then they speak with the Emperor's voice, so the Black Templars can suck it only the Captain General of the Custodes speaks with the Emperor's voice. If it was literally anyone else with that kind of authority then it would be someone even closer to the Emperor in authority than merely his voice. So, the general hatred of Sickers just isn't feasible anyway. So it was changed. The Black Templar's hatred is only towards alien and rogue Sickers and that they have great respect for the ones in the fleet. And don't go bug fuck nuts. Which is no mean feat for a mortal Sicker. So why no librarians? There are three theories hypothesis in the Codex. They still enforce the Edict of Nikia. Considered most likely, given their special rule of the Witcher Gene C defect, they lost them during the Howling. A small part of it likely has to do with their recruiting process. Since they recruit from the worlds they crusade on, and they spend a decent amount of time purging renegade Sickers, there probably aren't any Sickers left for them to recruit and they're not likely to recruit Sickers found by somebody else. It still doesn't explain why they've never had a recorded incident of latent Sickers awakening once they've been recruited. Rather hilariously, the Black Templars are not even certain why they don't have librarians. Because the Librarius usually maintains the records of the chapter, the Templars have allowed their understanding of history to fall into decay. For the time being, they have come to the conclusion that the loss of the Librarius is simply part of the Emperor's grand design, and should he see fit to bless them with Librarians again they would gladly use them. Given how the war, and 40k in general, works as a genuine clap your hands if you believe searching. It could be that the Black Templar's own hatred of Sickers causes any sickers or latent sickers they didn't realize were such to either become non-sickers or simply inactive latent and remain that way. Rogel Dawn rejected chaos so strongly that basic demons were incapable of existing in his presence. So, it wouldn't be surprising if the Templar's hatred does prevent psychic manifestation. To add to all the confusion above, the newest codex says that the Black Templars flat out hate all sickers and treat their navigators and astropaths as little more than dignified slaves, throwing another wrench into the whole fucking situation. Notable members. Sigismund. First chapter master soul brother who made the chapter when Dawn broke the legion up. High Marshal Halbrecht. Their current chapter master. Gets fucked up by Imatek the storm lord who proceeds to take his arm as a trophy. Halbrecht then manages to destroy his entire fucking flagship as retaliation. Currently on a manhunt for Gazical Magurluk Thracker alongside Commissar Yerik Crusade to drive 
drive chaos away from some shrine worlds. Chaplin Grimaldus, the most baddest chaplain in the entire Godstam Imperium, with the possible exception of Lemitz. He fought the biggest orc war egg in history on a very old temple that had relics and artifacts that were sacred to the Imperium. The battle only ended after the temple collapsed and buried every orc and marine under the rubble. But since Grimaldus was too badass to die, he crawled out of the temple with a few relics he managed to save. And besides the guy has the word Grim in his fucking name how can he not be badass? The main caveat about his description is in his depiction in the book Hell's Reach, featuring Grimaldus service in Armageddon leading up to his title as Hero of Hell's Reach, where we learn he is equally skilled at tantrum throwing sulking, as he is kicking lots of orcas. But to be fair, this isn't the Grimaldus we know and love as first. Hell's Reach is about him manning up under constant pressure, him finding he has to stop feeling like he has to be his old boss's bitch all the time and learning to be the butch. He does manage to man up and becomes the baddest we all know and love. By the end of things, like, the very last second before a cathedral falls on him and knocks him out and not a second sooner. Plus, he had the stones to do it all without a Rosarius. Antioch, a Tetchmarine who made especially holy hand grenades. Tankard, he who endures, also is partial to bitches. High Marshal Ludoldus. A previous High Marshal notable for having led the Templars during two crusades that were separated by over 2000 years, specifically the Vinculus Crusade, 833 M41, and the Gerolus Crusade, 645 M39. Considering that he was already High Marshal by the time of Vinculus, one can only conclude that Ludoldus was fucking old, and totally blows Dante out of the water as the guy even has old in his fucking name. Or you know warp shenanigans. Castel and Draco. Notable role in the Vinculus Crusade, notably in killing Inquisitor Lord Vinculus after he got possessed, but not after his own losses. That is, he got buried in rubble after lacing the cult's massive fortress with explosives. For his valiant efforts, he got his lost parts replaced with bionics, a relic suit of armor and Lord Vinculus sword, declared excommunicate traitorous in if supplement, becoming the first SM special character with a model who turned traitor in 40k. Well, turn traitor according to the Inquisition who just lost a Lord Inquisitor to him and embarrassing the entire Inquisition with such a reveal. High Marshal Bohemond led the chapter during the War of the Beast. Marshal Magneric C. Tankard above imagine if he was in command of his own crusade. Unlike most dreadnoughts he still kept his name and rank and rarely slept which made him into a crazy fanatic and implied to be the source of the religious zeal. Spends most of his days hunting his old BFF Warsmith Corkator until Orcs of the Beast showed up. Daily rituals of a Black Templar. Think angry marines but with less copious cursing. 350. Morning call to prayer. Initiates awaken their respective neophytes from their comfortable slumber on bare stone floors. This often involves buckets of ice water, voxcasters playing hymns with the volume control not broken off, or a power armor shot foot up the ass depending on the initiate in question. Complaints that this awakening occur 10 minutes prior to scheduled revali are met with re-administration of the waking aid. 4 o'clock. Morning prayer. Neophytes are berated for their perceived failings by their responsible initiates, who are in turn berated by the Sword Brethren. The Sword Brethren by the Castellans. Up to the marshal who berates the entire fleet then swears a solemn vow to an icon of the god emperor that they will do better and prove themselves worthy by stabbing heretics in the throat with their swords. Tactics may also be discussed, and orders of battle issued, assuming they involve rushing headlong at the enemy. 5 o'clock. Morning firing rites. The initiates school their apprentices on the art of shooting Xenos in the face while simultaneously swinging a chain sword. This shooting preferably occurs while rushing across the active firing range in order to close with the targets and hit it with the bolt pistol if possible. 7 o'clock. Morning battle practice. Initiates inform their neophytes that if they are done being cowardly whelps. They may now avail themselves of a sword with which to stab shit. 1155. 
Milk and cookies break. Any neophyte stupid enough to drink milk or eat cookies in front of their initiate gets their meal pushed and their noses and eyeballs respectively. Things get interesting if they dip their cookies in their milk. 12 o'clock. Midday prayer. Neophytes are told how poorly they did during the morning exercises. Any sense of pride or joy is rooted out. The marshal leads the fleet in prayer and promises the god emperor they will kill more things even more righteously this afternoon. 1300 hours. Midday meal. The chapter serfs provide cold cuts for the brothers enjoyment. Lunch meat is usually collected by the serfs following each battle and stored in the ship's freezers. Naturally. Neophytes do not get something to eat yet as the initiates insult them for even assuming they get to eat. The neophytes soon learn that the god emperor has a sense of humor when the initiates are informed that only sword brethren on up are allowed to eat. 1315 Tactical Indoctrination Locations of the vital organs and blood vessels of Xeno species that may be encountered on the current crusade and the weak spots of demons are reviewed. Occasionally an initiate will cuff his neophyte on the back of the head and reiterate yes that, you stab that retard. Other tactics may also be discussed as long as they involve inserting blades into things. 1400 hours. Afternoon battle practice. Initiates attempt to kill their neophyte with a power sword. If the neophyte is not dead in 4 hours, he passes muster. 1800 hours. Evening firing rites. Neophytes are instructed in how to operate heavy and specialty weaponry dropped by their responsible initiate when he abandons it so that he may swing his sword with both hands to better kill shit and is eaten by a monstrous creature which he bravely, read, stupidly, read, righteously, tried to skullfuck and CQC. 2000 hours. Evening prayer. After a short session of critique and berating, the Emperor's champion leads a sermon about how awesome the Emperor is and how much he wants them to bifurcate or decapitate the current heretics mutants Xenos they are fighting with power weapons. 2100 hours. Evening meal. A feast is served by the chapter serfs. Alcohol and anything that has a pleasant taste will not be consumed as the god Emperor looks down on those that enjoy life. No hamburger. No cheeseburgers. No french fries, no milkshakes, no potato chips, you will drink water distilled from the fleet's waste reactor and like it 2130. Night fighting zero gravity exercises. Initiates instruct their charges on stabbing things by the glow of a power sword and how to fight in a zero gravity environment without jump packs. Stab foe. Use corpse as a springboard to assault another foe. Repeat. 2315. War gear maintenance. Initiates encourage neophytes to keep weapons in proper working order with phrases like, sharpen your shit you fucking incompetent bastard as the god emperor reserves great disdain for those that kill heretics with dull blades. 2345. Free time. The initiate is free to challenge his neophyte to a short duel. Wounds heal better during sleep anyway. 0 hundred hours rest period. The initiate sees his neophyte off to bed, with one last punch to the face to help him fall asleep. The sword brethren then punch the initiates in the face before they retire for rest period. Note that this constitutes a day off for a black templar. A working day will involve 23 hours of rushing monstrous creatures with melee weapons. Neophytes are expected to pull bullet sponge duty so the initiate is not distracted by little things like enemy gunfire, and that their spilled blood will allow the initiates to glide on the ground to their enemy faster. As seen here, Black Templar combat training. Brother initiate Teuton Mick Templar. Neophyte. Get your ass over here and hold my Lus cannon while I charge that carnifex with my power fist neophyte hands wolf gang. But sir I have not yet earned my power armor and a Lus cannon weighs 100 kilos. Brother initiate Teuton Mick Templar. You are going to pick up that spotlight and burn some fucking Xenos. And you are going to like it note, it would be nice if this could happen. But in reality. You can only arm neophytes with shotguns or bolt pistols with CCWS. Though you were able to arm and initiate with both a Lus Cannon and a Power Fist in their original codex. Hilariously too you could go completely overboard and have one marine armed with a Power Fist, three bolt pistols, or two bolt pistols and a bolter, a chain sword, 
a power weapon, a heavy bolter, a missile launcher, or a multi-melter, a less cannon, and a plasma cannon all at the same time, though while funny is still a terrible thing to put on the battlefield as he can still only fire one per turn, pistols notwithstanding, talk about a jack of all trades.